For years, Afghanistan has been heavily dependent on international financial assistance and humanitarian aid. One of the largest organizations that has been working in Afghanistan is the Norwegian Refugee Council, which provided help to hundreds of thousands of Afghans. But with the Taliban takeover, the council's ability to help has been severely disrupted as the weather is beginning to turn cold. Jan Eglund is the Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council. He recently returned from a trip to Kabul. He joins me now. Jan Eglund, welcome back to the news hour. We have seen these scenes uh, in Kabul, not only of the internally displaced, but of entire families selling all of their furniture simply to stay alive. How desperate is the situation there? It is beyond desperate, really. Uh, listen, I've been to Afghanistan many times over recent years. Always a crisis, uh, violence, uh, horrors, uh, displacement. But this time you feel like the whole population is in like a free fall. Uh, the, 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 the mothers and the children, uh, the fathers I met in the camps around Kabul, these are people who have fled to Kabul over the years, including now very recently, they told me we have no reserve, we have no income, there is no food, we will freeze and starve to death this winter unless aid is able to flow and the public sector is able to resume services, including paying public servants. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said this week that the Taliban are cooperating uh, and are allowing humanitarian aid workers uh, to move in the country. Is the Norwegian Refugee Council able to do what it needs to do? Yes, we are. We have been negotiating access now province by province, not, not only through the meetings that I and others had with the top Taliban leadership in Kabul. The most important thing has to happen with the, the, the leaders, the commanders, the, the men with the guns locally. They have allowed us unimpeded access with male and female staff in one province after the other. I think it's sinking in with them now that the population that they now control are in a desperate situation and they need our help to help people. And what are the greatest needs? What are you delivering for that help? No, I mean, and now we're in life-saving mode is really. They do not have heating. They do not have a shelter. They do not have food at the moment. There's been a collapse in the economy. There is no banking system functioning. We cannot transfer money to, to our, our, our aid workers. Uh, th this has to, to, to restart again in Afghanistan if we are to save lives. The international community is concerned about supporting the Taliban, uh, about giving the Taliban any kind of recognition. Do you believe aid can be delivered without the Taliban benefiting from it? Yes, uh, it can. I mean, we're, we're in situations all over the world where the rulers, those in, in control, are not to the liking of our donors. We as humanitarians are, are impartial, neutral, independent but we can as international actors do the uh, the direct uh, relief we can help millions uh, through the un system the international ngo uh, uh, there and the red cross red crescent system but on top of that we need to get the public services up and running again there are 300,000 publicly funded and paid for teachers they were on the payroll of the World Bank up until now. Uh, it, the health sector uh, as well. Unless there are trust funds held by the UN, directly funding these teachers and nurses and doctors and water engineers with the World, World Bank money, which is sitting in Washington, we will fail because we as humanitarians cannot do it all. Well, let's talk about that money sitting in Washington. Uh, senior U.S. officials tell me they're in no rush to unfreeze billions of dollars that have been frozen since the Taliban took over. Are you saying that the U.S. must unfreeze billions of dollars that are currently being held in order to prevent or, or at least confront this humanitarian crisis? Yes. Listen, I understand that nobody wants to help their previous enemy. But this money is not for the Taliban. 
These are for the civilian population that were left behind. It's the same women and children who were there before. The urgency has to be given now to the decision makers. I was not that impressed when I saw that the G20 countries, on one hand, agreed with me that it is urgent, and then didn't come up with a formula that can be put into practice now. We don't have, we don't have weeks, we have days to fix this. And what you're saying is, is what's important, not only to, to unfreeze the assets, uh, but also banks uh, in Kabul uh, need to be allowed to function again, right? The U.S. needs to take the lead in unfreezing the assets of these banks so that they will function, so that we can do aid work. They need to unfreeze the funding that needs to go to the public sector. But the two things have to happen in the next days. We have no time to wait because people will perish this winter. When uh, you met the Taliban, you told them that they must respect human rights. They must respect women's rights, which is one of the key requirements that the international community says the Taliban uh, have to live up to in order for money to flow. Um, today, in northern Afghanistan, we see some girls going to school, uh, but many in Kabul are not. Do you believe the Taliban are respecting human rights? In many places, not. Uh, but in more and more places, we are able now to negotiate what is important. Uh, free, unimpeded access to all minorities, religious, ethnic, etc., for male and female staff, boys and girls education also, yes. It, but it's mixed. It has always been mixed. But we are doing a tremendous disservice with the women and children that we are so concerned with if we are sitting now uh, doing a sort of a hands-off exercise, sitting on the fence and seeing how this moves. If we wait for the last girls' education corner in, in Afghanistan, we will wait for yes. It, it would be the ultimate uh, insult to these girls that we do not provide food for them because we're still negotiating secondary or tertiary education. Jan Eglin, thank you very much. Thank you.